Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's morning for me because I'm still on Sydney time. Um, it's, uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, I am Rachel Botsman. I am a writer and an expert on uh, the collaborative economy and changes that are happening in the world. Thank you, Rachel. The first question, and to set the framework, is can you please tell us what collaborative consumption is? And can you give some examples? Sure. Um, so the interesting thing about collaborative consumption is it's a reinvention of old market behaviors. So renting, sharing, bartering, collaborating, um, but using technology to transform them in ways on a scale that have never been possible before. And it's really all around us. Um, so everything from Airbnb, where people are realizing that they have uh, underused assets in their homes, their spare rooms, their boats, their tree houses, and a company is created in a marketplace where if you need a place to stay, you can find a place on a marketplace. All the way through to ideas like Uber, where you don't have to be a traditional taxi driver. Anyone with a car and spare capacity can give people lifts. Um, so they are like the two uh, sort of poster children, if you like. And then there's just thousands more across other sectors. So um, peer to peer lending platforms crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter, uh, currency transfer platforms like TransferWide, um, food assembly platforms that match uh, farm producers with consumers, um, Skillshare platforms that match people with skills that people want to learn, and you get the idea. <laughs> How will collaborative consumption change the workplace, or traditional workplace? Uh, so how will it change traditional businesses? Yes. Um, so in a couple of ways, the first thing that traditional businesses are, are realizing is that um, this is really a, a model that creates new value from existing assets that they have. So they can look at um, things that resources, people, um, inefficiencies they have and think about creating new value from those. Uh, so. A really good example is Marriott Hotels uh, realized that their meeting rooms and their conference rooms were massively underutilized. So they've partnered with a platform called Liquid Space, where if you're traveling and you need somewhere to work, you can book these places within Marriott. So that's the first thing. Um, it will change their business models. It will change the way that they think they can deliver value. Uh, the second thing for traditional companies, and, and this one is often harder to get their heads around, is that this depends on different kinds of brands and different kinds of trust. So this isn't just um, a company creates a product or a service and then it delivers it directly to a customer. Often what's happening is that people are exchanging directly with one another. And this depends on a new form of, of peer trust that is, is far more complicated than just traditional corporate brands. Behind all these kind of, of projects, there are uh, investment and there are a lot of trust that, that people and new entrepreneurs uh, need, right? So, what advice can you give to the entrepreneurs uh, and to the millennials for, for getting all that kind of investment and trust about the people who has the money for invest? Um, so, so I, I worked in a venture fund, so I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs pitch ideas. And, and the interesting thing is um, I'm always impressed by entrepreneurs who are not worried about the money at first. They're not worried about what they're going to build. Um, what they're really passionate about is understanding the problem, that they want to understand the problem that they're solving better than anyone in the world, that they want to almost marry that problem. Um, and, and this, I think, is often a stage that many entrepreneurs miss. They go straight to, I've got an idea or five ideas, and I need to raise capital, and then I need to build something. And then, oh, I've just spent a lot of money, and I don't have any customers, and I need to raise more money. And whereas, and they haven't really figured out what is it that is meaningful um, that people are going to want and, and need in their lives. So that's, that's the first piece of advice is don't go with five ideas. It should be one idea that you really understand and that you want to marry for the next five to 10 years of your life. Um, and I promise you, like once you start to understand the problem, um, the solution you should create becomes much clearer. Uh, the second thing is the first thing you build, it should be cheap and cheerful. 
um, it's, you know, there's, there's all this advice of just get it out there, lean startup, but it's, it's true. Like don't create something really expensive, create the minimal viable product to actually test how people interact with the idea. Um, and then, and then the, the money doesn't always come, but the money will come. It will just take, in most instances, three times longer than entrepreneurs think. Hello, Rachel. Do you think it's possible to develop the Uber model in every industry? Uh, do I think it's possible to replicate? Um, yes, I think there are, not in every single industry, but in most industries, I qualify that. So if you think about what Uber is, if you strip it back and forget about taxis, it's a very efficient supply and demand engine. Um, you know, I need a ride, someone can offer a ride, and I can match those things with a truss layer over the top. And most industries are not efficient supply and demand mechanisms. There's actually uh, an inefficiency that the customer experiences. So, um, yes, and I think we're already seeing with Uber, you know, it's back in the UK recently, and they've just launched Uber Fresh for the delivery of food, Uber Rush for um, logistics, which could really challenge things like FedEx and DHL, but also the traditional post office. Um, even Uber Health they're testing. Um, Uber Kittens, where people can have a cat for the day. Uber Helicopter, Uber Christmas Trees, Uber Ice Cream. Um, so I think, you know, taxis is just the beginning where they saw an inefficient supply and demand problem and real customer pain, back to our point. And they will just apply this and many others will apply the same thinking to other problems in our lives. Which countries are the more advanced in this type of revolution and if there is a specific culture that it's needed to develop? Um, so that's a great question. Um, so countries are more mature around uh, different sectors in different parts of the world and it's often a problem they face at a national level so for example um, in the uk and parts of europe uh, many peer-to-peer -peer social lending crowdfunding alternative forms of financing have the fastest rates of growth uh, that's because of the gfc and and the major crisis in trust in traditional banks um, Germany, um, you see, and Finland and some of the Nordics, some of the most innovative things happening around transportation. Um, not just like car sharing and bike sharing, but thinking of how you actually link all these things to really change mobility. Um, and then, you know, still in, and then in, in countries like Israel and the Netherlands and Estonia, there's really interesting things happening around identity systems and reputation systems and payment systems. So not the platforms themselves, but the ecosystem that makes these things work. Um, the thing that's fascinated me, and I have literally been to every continent except Antarctica studying these things. I don't know if the penguins are doing it up there, but maybe they are. But um, the point being is I've always been amazed at the similarities over the differences and I've also been amazed at how countries want to believe they're different like the number one question I'm asked is but my country is dangerous or my country is you know South Africa my country is risky these ideas are never gonna work or um, even all the way through to Britain we're very conservative we're very traditional these ideas are, are not gonna work and and I think that's a really interesting default reaction is that in some way we think we're going to return back to this world. Um, that we, the skeptical, even me, the skeptical part in all of us, for some reason wants to believe that these ideas are not going to work. And in most countries, they take on different forms. They take off and are adopted in very similar, similar ways. And I should also say, it's not a Gen Y thing. Like if you actually look at the users, yes, Gen Y are often, um, and Gen Z, early adopters, but it's far more spread across ages in terms of the early adoption community and, and a real mix of men and women as well. How do you visualize the future of, the, of a share economy? I will be happy when we don't even have to use the term anymore. You know, when it doesn't have a label, it's just the way things are. And I love it when people say, I'm so bored of hearing about Airbnb and Uber. It's not new anymore. Well, that's great, you know, because it's, it's just becoming a new way to travel. It's becoming a new way to get around. So um, I think 
sh you know, many shared systems, collaborative models. My kids are two and four. Like the idea for my son that he would have paid to have a bank account in a bank is going to be like having a fax machine. He just will be like, that's just weird. It just doesn't make sense. So um, I think the blockchain um, that sits under Bitcoin is going to have a massive impact on sharing assets um, because it, it will enable us to transfer value in a really direct, uh, secure peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Um, and I think this notion of, and, and the thing that scares me about it, which I didn't even see like seven years ago, is how it's tied to the whole trend of instant gratification. Like getting things, I tap my phone and, and this is going to arrive on demand. And that's the piece that worries me is that you don't want to drive more of a consumer culture that people are just pressing their phone to get you know, goods delivered and the people delivering the goods are, are paid minimal wages. So it's those inequalities that the market will often pull us towards that we sort of have to figure out how to keep in check. Which is the major threat or enemy in a collaborative conception? The enemy, funny enough, is misunderstanding. The enemy is the law. Um, the enemy is regulators, politicians, the legal system being not really understanding this and being like the best thing for the public is to shut these ideas down. Um, and that is very dangerous. That is a very dangerous way to treat innovation in its, its early forms. Um, so when regulators who are used to managing different models say we need to protect the incumbent interest and shut this down or make it really difficult um, is the biggest threat. Um, so we've seen that with the cases against Airbnb and then the big cases against Uber. Um, that is just the tip of the, there's now another big case Amazon have just taken out against a platform called Fiverr um, where people are being paid to do fake reviews. Um, on Amazon products and Amazon is suing Fiverr and the people that have made these fake reviews because they're saying they're creating this dishonest system. So I think we're going to see all these reputation lawsuits and um, the, the law is the biggest threat. The law doesn't like it when technology outpaces it and that's what's happening. Technology has outpaced the law. Which are the latest startups in collaborative consumption? God, there's so many. I mean, I, I think it's, if I think of those that are just about to break, um, that are just underneath the surface, uh, you know, I'll just go across different categories. Um, Cohelo is a really interesting one um, that you wouldn't think of, but is enabling hospitals to share equipment because expensive hospital equipment is full of idling capacity and sits there. Um, and that's really interesting to me. Um, as I mentioned, uh, TransferWise, Currency Fair, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, platforms that bypass the bank. So if we have opposite currency needs, it matches us. Um, this was started by the same guys who started Skype. You can see, like, why do you need the bank? Bank, because you have the internet to create this kind of matching. Um, I think there's really interesting ones starting to emerge around property. So um, crowdfunding around residential investments, um, crowdfunding around getting your mortgage. So maybe you don't fully own your home, but maybe the bank doesn't own the other 90%, you know, 10 people do. Um, the food assembly, I think, is one of the most exciting food startups I've seen that really could transform the supply chain between uh, producers of food and consumers of food, cutting out a lot of the middlemen that don't serve either particularly well. Um, blah, blah, car, I talked about uh, this morning at Wobi, um, you know, not just taking off in Europe, India, it's starting to emerge actually in Mexico, so ride sharing. Um, logistics, uh, there's so many popping up in logistics, Postmates, um, Amazon just launched their own crowd, uh, fun, crowd shipping model. Um, professional services is the other big growing category. So um, Skillbridge, UpCouncil, Hourly Nerd. There's, there's just thousands of, of people applying this thinking. If you ask me um, what do I think are the next big categories, I would say it's finance, logistics and learning um, are the, the ones really ripe for disruption. In the case of finance, which is our uh, firm, uh, I, I agree that sometimes the law is bypassed by the technology, 
but also there's a risk of fraud. No? So how can you manage that and how can you control it to avoid an abuse of this uh, new type of collaboration? I, I, you just, I love it when people in financial services talk about fraud because it's like, seriously? Did, I mean, no offense, but I don't know what you do in financial services, but did the bankers really not abuse the system? Did the bankers, <laughs> did they really not commit fraud? Um, do they, these institutions really serve the people they were set up to serve? I, I don't think so. I mean, broken trust is the driver as, as to why these alternatives are rising up. And the interesting thing is they are getting regulated and by, you know, the FCA and endorsed by, I'm going back to England just because I was there, really quickly um, because they are there to serve the end customer. They're not there to serve the financial institution. So they have a different mindset from the beginning. and. I, in terms of where my money is more secure, these are tech people. Um, I think they understand data and privacy and financial security um, better than many of the traditional banks, which is something they've had to change their infrastructure and, and learn and adapt around. So um, it, it's a little bit of a, a passion of mine thinking about financial disruption because I think it's a classic example of how an institution got so big um, that it can cause so much harm in the world and it, it really needs to be rethought at a global level. I like bankers as well, so don't. <laughs> Rachel, how did you get attracted and start and interested in this subject? And also I read another question that you're also an investor in disruptive initiatives. Mm -hmm. So what kind of initiatives do you invest in or uh, pick up. So I'll answer the second one first. I, I was an investor. I helped start a fund called the Collaborative Fund. And it, it sounds ridiculous now, but um, these startups couldn't get money. Um, like I, the number of times I would sit with the entrepreneurs and I would sit with traditional investors and they say, oh, it's too risky and they're never going to work. And I mean, the Airbnb guys have four years, you know, pitching. And um, so we started the Collaborative Fund to, to really um, bring in big investors to say this was a credible thing. And, and I felt my job was done when you know, tens of million, too much money was flowing into these startups. I, I'm also not very good with numbers. I'm good with people. And, and that doesn't make me a very good venture capitalist because I wanted to protect the entrepreneurs a little bit too much. And then on a serious note, it, it creates conflict of interest. You know, I can't hold um, investments in these companies and give an independent, um, neutral point of view. So that was really important to me that people didn't think I was talking about something. We were taking early stage investments in, um, so Kickstarter was one, um, Bank Simple was another, Task Rabbit, Lyft, um, uh, Khan Academy, uh, Skillshare. So they were very early stage. And, and I really appreciate it because it, it brought me very close to these companies when they were just little babies. Um, I started thinking, uh, I didn't set out to even think that I was going to write a book and try to shape a, a movement or an ideology. I literally became obsessed um, with trying to figure out the connection between things like eBay and things like Zipcar and things like Craigslist. And the question I was asking myself was, okay, we're sharing all these photos and we're sharing all these videos and we're sharing all this knowledge. It can't be it. Like, this can't be where this technology is taking us. It must be creating a more profound shift. And like an itch, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever got obsessed with an idea. Like, it, it's, it's very annoying to the people you live with because it starts to consume your brain and you have to figure it out. And suddenly you see something and it's, it, this very complex thing becomes simple. Um, and... And that's, that's what happened to me, is that I started to see how these things were connected and there was this efficiency and this trust that was really changing not just human behavior, but market dynamics. Do you see traditional companies changing or it's impossible? Um, it's not impossible. It, it's never impossible. I, you know, I, I talked a little bit about this morning that you see three reactions, ostriches who, it's it's less um, they can't change it. They just don't want to believe it's happening to them. They just I've heard every argument under the sun as to why they're immune, 
um, from these patterns. Um, the fighters who say, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to use the law and regulation to save us. And then companies that really, they pioneer. And um, the ones that are really get this it's not about creating a venture fund or it's not about like backing a startup it's about applying this thinking um, to their business um, it's about saying you know maybe there are parts of our business that are underutilized and we could create a more asset like model it's about saying you know maybe um, people won't buy products from us so we have to come up with models of shared ownership and and we're seeing it everywhere you know from um, Home Depot which is like a really big I don't know if you have it in Mexico. Um, they've actually set the goal that you know half their products will be rented and shared um, by 2020, and, it, and it's really smart because they can then create a community around DIY and learning versus you just go into the store and you buy the sandpaper, whatever it is you buy. I've never been into Home Depot clearly. Um, all the major car companies have launched some kind of mobility platform. Um, they're saying they don't think the future of their business is selling cars. It's figuring out how to get people from A to B. Um, so, you know, BMW have launched Drive Now, Daimler have launched Car to Go, um, Hospitality, Hyatt have partnered with One Fine Stay. They're, they're all dipping their toes in. Um, I'm yet to see one that has basically said we're going to transform our entire business with this thinking, but we're getting there. Do you know uh, any interesting startup or project in Mexico or in Latin America can share us about? Um, so I, um, rather than reel off the names, I started this community called collaborativeconsumption.com and it has 32 curators uh, who understand the local markets and someone's actually written a post on Latin America. Um, so if you go and you Google collaborative consumption in Latin America, it will come up and it, it lists um, all the examples that are happening there. And there, there's also a directory where you can see. Um, but there is activity across most of these um, things that we've talked about. It's just, it's, it, they're just really, they're just born. Um, they're just starting to happen, which is an, a tremendous opportunity. Um, to really get in there now. And I think it's interesting, like, I've only been here 24 hours, but the number of questions I've been asked about, you know, Mexico being broken or Mexico um, has a trust issue or, I, I see all those broken systems as opportunities. I really, I really do. Like if, if people are frustrated, if they are frightened, if they are scared, um, if they're not satisfied, that's, that's where disruption happens. It doesn't happen when, People were sitting there going, I am enjoying my life and these products and I have no need to change. Um, so the, the friction is where you see innovation. So thank you for having me and thank you for your great questions. I, I really mean that. And um, I, I do see, uh, you know, every country has underutilized resources. And those resources, they are physical assets. Um, they are um, people's potential. Um, people's goodwill, people's energies, their passions. And, and this is really what I, I feel like people need to understand is you, is you don't need to create the Airbnb of X. You can really figure out how you unlock the potential of people through these ideas in, in really exciting ways. So thank you very much for having me.